what are the only two things in life that are certain? Yeah. 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 So we have TurboTax for tax preparation, and now we have After Steps for death preparation. After Steps simplifies end of life planning with an online step-by-step -step guide that enables users to create and complete a plan, store it, and then transfer it to designated beneficiaries upon their passing. Our business model is twofold. First, high value lead generation to service and product providers. And second, uh, an annual subscription fee to reflect the ongoing storage and the insurance and transfer. So, despite the fact that everyone will die, uh, over 65% of people do not plan for it. So why is planning important? Uh, for users, it gives them peace of mind and control over extremely important and personal decisions. For their surviving loved ones, it reduces the stress and conflict, the last minute expenses, and the amount of unclaimed assets, which today represent a $32 billion problem in the US. So why aren't people planning? Uh, the topic, it's uncomfortable. The issues are overly complex. Traditional providers in this space are inaccessible, and there are constant changes in both the regulatory environment and one's own life that causes them to delay planning. So here's our solution. Uh, we've designed after steps to address each of those deterrents. We bring a calm and reliable voice to the subject matter. We simplify the issues with interactive checklists, prioritized tasks, and digestible content. Uh, we efficiently connect people to the appropriate service and product providers. And lastly, our software as a service platform makes updating for changes incredibly easy. Uh, we provide ongoing alerts, notifications, and reminders that enable people to build a plan incrementally over time. So we're extremely excited about the baby boomer market. Um, this segment alone represents a $5 billion annual revenue opportunity to After Steps and has contributed to two important trends in this space. So the first one is a large increase in traditional end of life planning. Uh, the second is a shift in consumer behavior around death mm -hmm. from offline to online. So we've seen this with the growth of online obituary and online memorial sites, as well as the rise of death care e-commerce. Uh, these two trends make now the right time for after steps. So not only is our market large, it's extremely underserved. Traditional providers are fragmented offline and local. Uh, online companies have emerged to mirror these offline counterparts, but they too fail to address end of life as one complete event but rather in these vertically segmented silos. So our vision for After Steps is to bring to end of life what hundreds of companies have brought to weddings, um, an all-in-one comprehensive planning platform that reflects the way that the users and their families experience it. Today we've already had our first subscriber signups with um, extremely strong economics. So our average annual revenue per subscriber has been over two times the acquisition costs. Uh, our strategy going forward uh, to really gain scale and drive down acquisition costs further is to be uh, is to partner with uh, organizations that fall into two categories. So one would be uh, organizations to distribute after steps as a benefit to employees or members, um, as well as financial service and product providers. So if any of you out there, um, find me after. Okay, our team currently consists of two Harvard MBA students, myself and Emma Taylor, with backgrounds in finance, entrepreneurship, and marketing. We have our senior lead developer that's recently joined us, um, and a great team of advisors. To date, we've raised $40,000, uh, launched our initial website, and um, had our initial subscriber signups. Our product will be publicly available by the end of the month. So the last thing we want to leave you with is that our vision, uh, in five to 10 years, we believe everyone will have an online end of life plan. We want to be that standard and insert after steps into what is now an opaque, inefficient, and painful process. Uh, we're creating tremendous economic and social value around an experience that affects literally every single person, yet has witnessed very little innovation to date. They took the mic away from me, but they know that I don't need it. So uh, uh, what we're going to do here is something, is something a little unique in that we'd love to ask a lot of questions, but with the time we have, we really only have a time for about one question per plan. So we're just going to ask one of the panelists to ask 
what is the most important question they want to ask about after steps to decide whether they want to do the investment. So Xander, do you mind starting off and asking the question that you'd ask uh, if you only had one question to answer? Make it good. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so it's tough, but I'm willing to accept taxation. But I don't really accept the fact that I may die in a, in a period where I, I should be planning now. And I'm not sure that will change when I'm 80. Um, so what's your, what's your hook that gets someone past that psychological barrier? Is it a game? Do you market to different people? Do you give someone a reward? How do you actually get them to use the service, even if the service is brilliant? Yeah, so um, clearly the act of someone wanting to plan for their death is a difficult thing to get them to do. Uh, what we found is that there are life events that trigger people to be more um, willing to plan ahead. So whether you have a child, maybe you lose a parent, and the baby boomers, um, someone gets sick, these are all triggers uh, to consider planning. And we feel that basically by having this online um, ongoing service, we can capture those people um, for that, whatever it is, few days or few weeks that they're, um, that they're I guess, willing to convert at that point. Uh, so that's sort of the first market we're going for. And then, I mean, I agree. I think that there's a lot of room for market education here and actually working very hard to make this a more acceptable and less taboo of a topic. I, I agree. I think getting in their face at that point when they have some enthusiasm is pretty key. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, let's thank every staff. Hi, I'm Chris Kanak, my partner, Dr. Hensley Johnson, who is unable to make it on an MSTEM. We are a semiconductor company bringing IC chip fabrication techniques to medical devices. I'm here today to ask you to participate in our $2 million angel investment round to fund an 80% gross margin business with year five revenues of $120 million. But more importantly, any of the next generation of nerve stimulation. Market leaders in profound hearing loss and chronic pain must rely on expensive and technology ready electrodes in their products. This is a problem because pharmaceutical solutions are suboptimal with neurostimulators offering superior benefits, but the underlying lead hampers adoption. Let me play a sound clip for you, demonstrating what a current cochlear patient experiences and when we intend to take it. <coughs> improve device reproducibility during manufacturing, all at a reduced cost. The device we're focusing on right here, nerve stimulator, consists of two components, the implantable pulse generator and the electrode lead. The electrode lead is our focus. Today, these leads are built by hand with technicians under a microscope soldering at the microliter level. This process is costly, results in low quality, but more importantly, it stifles innovation. Our competency in design and manufacturing of biocompatible MEM systems allows us to decouple electrode count from flexibility, create higher performance therapies, and, do, and create and, while producing new patient populations. Our competitors cannot do this. Our technology blocks them from using the same biocompatible materials. They will have to go through full FDA clinical trials to bring the device to market. Today, we are in the process of so we actually signed an exclusive option with the University of Michigan on the technology. We have demonstrated efficacy in preclinical testing, where we've shown increased brain excitation. And the devices are at a leading cochlear company undergoing evaluation today. The market for nerve stimulators is $3.6 billion. For leads, this means a market of over $500 million, doubling from where it's at today. This consists of treatments for chronic pain, Parkinson's, epilepsy, and hearing loss. What this does not account for is emergent therapies in obesity, depression, and blindness. Our initial focus is going to be on the hearing loss segment because we have established partnerships in this area. The lead is the highest percentage of the device cost, and the lead consists of the most electrodes, so highest manufacturing pain. The hearing loss segment is extremely concentrated. With the smaller players looking for any type of advantage here, we are going to exploit this. We are taking our product to advanced bionics initially. We're going to deliver them a two-tiered solution 
the first two years of manufacturing savings. We'll deliver them $500 per device. This is enabling them. The second tier, we're going to deliver a technology solution that allows them to grow their market from people who are profoundly deaf to people who have moderate hearing loss. Today, when I try to implant you with the cochlear implant, if you have residual hearing, that would be damaged and you're not a patient. Advanced bionics can compete with cochlear by expanding the market going after moderate deafness. We are here today to ask for a $2 million investment in exchange for 40% equity. At that point, we'll have demonstrated efficacy in preclinical testing. We'll have manufactured over 500 devices. We'll have granted a freedom to operate opinion, and we'll have a letter of engagement with our first customer, Advanced Bionics, by September. We see an exit occurring out of one of two means, either through one of our customers, such as Medtronic or Boston Scientific, who wants to protect their market share, or one of our competitors, Great Batch, who's actually looking to supplement their neurostimulation portfolio and have done acquisitions in the past. We have a five-year investment horizon with venture-level returns. This is a product with proven efficacy that our competitors cannot do. But more than anything, it redefines the market. <laughs> okay, um, your one question, uh, how about Nancy? <coughs> Can you ask the one question that would help you decide whether to invest in this company or not? So very interesting idea that you presented us today. It seems like this should be a very capital-intensive business, uh, yet what you're showing is that you just need a few million dollars to get to break even. It's, it's kind of hard for me to get my head around that, so maybe you can just address how you've gotten around what has traditionally been um, you know, big dollars required. So there's a couple things we're doing here that really make this business capital efficiency. In the short presentation, I think cut those slides out. One, we have a partnership with the University of Michigan, and we're able to use, utilize their nanofabrication lab. So all the research and development, so capital equipment, we don't have to buy. We use their equipment. Manufacturing of these devices, we're going to outsource these to a semiconductor foundry, such as Silex or Microwave, that focuses on biocompatible MEM systems. And they actually have FDA approval for these. And the final portion that makes this very capital efficient is our concentrated customer base. We have repeat customers who buy multiple designs. We're not going out and marketing this to thousands of people. We have a set of 20 customers that will buy these. Okay, well, thank you. All right, thank you. So let's start by asking a question. By show of hands, how many people in the audience have had, ever had an eyelash stuck in your eye? It's really uncomfortable, right? Imagine having that sensation 24 hours a day, every day of your life. And on top of that, imagine being so sensitive to the light, so sensitive to the elements, you can't walk outside without wearing some kind of protective glasses or goggles. And this, this is what it's like to have severe dry eye disease. So four highlights. This is a crippling unmet need. It's a huge market, two and a half million dollars in the US alone. And it's a population of baby boomers. And finally, we have a disruptive technology that I'm really excited to show you, proven in humans. Okay, so this is a, uh, a technology that has come out of um, the Stanford Biodesign Program, and we've been working uh, with a group of scientists and engineers with both corporate and uh, small business experience, and also uh, clinical surgeon Dr. Bonnet and Jane, who sees these patients on a daily basis. We've also been lucky enough to uh, be advised by an absolutely blue chip advisory board, some Silicon Valley's uh, real pillars in the medtech community. This disease affects more than 1.6 million Americans. Now, like I said, these are this is a big boomer population. Average age of 59 years. It causes crippling, uh, crippling symptoms and also uh, ultimately lead to vision loss. And these patients are currently spending more than $2 billion a year to treat this disease. And unfortunately, they're spending this $2 billion a year on treatments that don't work. So there are artificial tears, there are punctal plugs which clog up the drainage sites of the eyes and don't work if you're not producing tears. There are these goggle solutions that uh, are not only ineffective but also uh, a little ridiculous to go out in public. <laughs> and then there's a really dramatic surgery called prosorophy where they literally sew the eyelids shut. I just want to be clear, there are patients who are choosing to go blind over during the pain of severe, uh, severe dry eye disease. Now there's also a pharmaceutical which has become in the standard of care, it's called restasis. It's a topical immunosuppressant. Now, unfortunately, this is a terrible drug. 
is not effective and has a horrible side effect profile. One patient even told us that it feels like putting a shot of vodka in his eye. Unimaginable. What's even more amazing is it's an absolute blockbuster. It's $700 million a year. 460,000 patients prescribed, growing at 20% per year. And it's not because it's a good drug. It's because these patients have nothing else. They deserve better. They deserve something that's going to restore their natural tear production and allow them to get back to their daily life. That's exactly what our product provides does. It's a small injection-based device that can be done, uh, can be done in office, and it activates a, uh, a functional but latent tear gland to produce tears. Cool slide in the back. I'm really excited about this. We've actually shown, uh, demonstrated this in a, person, in a patient with dry eyes. We've done this using an FDA-approved surrogate device. So a combination of uh, devices to reproduce the effect. Now the dashed line at the top um, represents that, uh, normal tear production, y-axis being uh, the volume of tears. And the blue bar here is the control. This little bump, I mentioned that Restasis is ineffective. This is what Restasis gives you, the $700 million a year drug, 20% growth. And this, this is what we got in our first unoptimized experiment, just our first attempt at this. More than 10 times the effect of restasis. So we were really excited about it. Okay, so very briefly, regulatory strategy, we're gonna to go to Europe first, come back to the United States for a, a PMA. We've been working very closely with the ophthalmic CRO called Dora. On the reimbursement side of things, uh, we're gonna to go to self-pay. So like cosmetics, ophthalmology has a strong precedent for self-pay, LASIK, and lenses, et cetera. So what do patients think? We've surveyed more than 250 patients and we said, if this point is better than restasis, would you use it? 70% said yes, 60% that they would pay out of pocket at our price point. So I imagine what would be if we said more than 10 times better than restasis. Okay, so a very quick uh, glance at our operational plan. We're going to require three, um, three phases of financing. I want to zoom in on the seed. The first milestone for the seed, I think this is one of the most exciting things for the purposes of this competition. For a mere $12,000, we can, uh, we can complete our first clinical study. So we're basically here to repeat what we've done in the first demand in a larger cohort of 20 patients. We can do this with our, uh, our established, uh, our close clinical collaborators. We've already written the protocol. Okay, again, finally, it's a crippling on that need. It's a huge market, uh, almost two and a half billion dollars in the US. It affects uh, the baby boomers. We have a disruptive, disruptive technology. We've already proven it works. And it's 10,000 bucks, we'll get us very close to this going for trial. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And the ophthalmologist that we're working with, not only our team member, but also the uh, entire Stanford ophthalmology department, is really excited about this, giving them another option, something that actually does work over the stasis. Uh, and with regard to the, the blemish, actually, the, the use model is uh, for this cash um, in the evening hours, and basically then as needed um, from then. And there's a, another um, little caveat to the technology that also uh, as it does as well. But basically, you know, you're, not worrying, you're not worrying something on your face about the day. 